When you provide care to someone who is ill, there is a risk that germs could spread and you could become ill too. The person you are caring for needs protection against germs as well. Without good infection control, they could become even more ill. Infections can be fatal. That is why it is important to understand how to control the spread of germs. Germs such as bacteria and viruses are microorganisms. They are found everywhere in nature, including on and inside our bodies. There are many types of microorganisms. Most of them are positive. They maintain our atmosphere, make soil fertile, and help us digest the foods we eat. Microorganisms are used in making medicines, cheese, and wine. Some microorganisms are harmful, causing infections and disease. The primary defense against germs and infection is healthy, unbroken skin. The skin protects us and acts as a barrier against germs. If the skin is cut or broken, germs can enter the body and cause infection. Our immune system is a second line of defense. It works to kill germs that have entered the body. When we are healthy, our immune system naturally protects us against them. Some people are more vulnerable to infection because of a lowered immune system. These include babies, the elderly, those with chronic illness or recovering from surgery, smokers, alcoholics, and those who are physically or emotionally exhausted. There are five ways that germs are spread. They include direct contact, indirect contact, airborne contact, vehicle spread, and vector spread. Direct contact involves skin-to-skin -skin contact. It happens any time you touch someone who is sick. Colds are often spread by direct contact. When someone sneezes into his or her hand and later touches another person's hand, germs are transferred. Those germs can enter the second person's body if he touches his nose, eyes, or mouth. Bathing someone, changing dressings, or disposing of body fluids such as feces, urine, sputum, or blood are other examples of direct contact. Indirect contact occurs when you touch dishes, bed linens, clothing, or equipment that has been in contact with someone who is ill. Airborne contact takes place when you breathe in dust particles or droplets containing germs. These germs are suspended in the air after an infected person sneezes, coughs, or talks. Vehicle spread occurs when germs enter your body through contaminated food, drugs, water, or blood products. Vector spread is a spread of germs from animals and insects. Malaria is spread by infected mosquitoes. Ticks carry the germs that cause Lyme's disease. According to the U.S. Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, hand hygiene is the single most important means of reducing the spread of infection. Hand hygiene means cleaning your hands, using an alcohol-based hand rub, or washing your hands with soap and water. Hands should be cleaned before and after caring for someone, after handling equipment, removing gloves, using the bathroom, blowing your nose or sneezing, after handling pets, and before preparing and serving food. Alcohol-based hand rubs are a very effective and convenient method for cleaning hands. They act quickly to kill a wide spectrum of germs. Alcohol-based hand rubs are available as gels or foams. Alcohols are flammable, so be sure to store them away from high temperatures or flames. To apply the gel, start with dry hands. Use the amount of gel recommended on the product. Apply to the palm of one hand and then rub the gel all over the hands, including the back of the hands and in between the fingers. Continue rubbing until hands are dry. With continued use of alcohol-based hand rubs, a coating can build up on the hands, making them sticky. After five or more uses, wash hands with soap and water to remove the sticky residue. Alcohol-based hand rubs are not recommended when hands are visibly soiled. When hands are visibly soiled, you must wash with soap and water. 
Use antimicrobial soap if there is a chance that hands have come in contact with harmful microorganisms. Plain soap may not adequately kill or remove pathogens from the hands. To wash hands, use liquid soap dispensed from a pump bottle. When bar soap is used, it should be in small bars, changed frequently, and placed on a soap rack that promotes drainage. According to the Center for Disease Control, bar soaps that do not drain well can become contaminated with germs. The following is a demonstration of improper hand washing. We used a product on Cindy's hands that when held under a black light mimic germs on the hand. Imagine these germs on your hands after providing care. This is the way most people wash their hands and I'm going to show you the downfall and the pitfalls of this procedure. They usually go ahead and get the soap first, then turn on the faucet, and then quickly wash it. And that's it. And they usually use a towel that's next to the sink that other people have used to dry their hands. Now let's see how many germs are left on Cindy's hand. As you can see, there are still quite a few germs left on her hand after a normal washing. You come in, your hands are contaminated or dirty, you turn on the faucet, you want to wet your hands first, then you get a large enough volume of soap that you cover the entire surface of your hands. Remember the last demonstration? I did it very quickly. Well this, the proper way you need to do a minimum of 15 seconds, you need to make sure you cover your wrists, your thumbs, all your fingers. If you have jewelry, you want to move your ring up and get underneath there. You need to take your nail brush, get underneath your nails, and you really should keep your nails one fourth inch long. You don't want long nails. Be sure and rub. Very, do a good job of rubbing because you want friction to remove those germs. Make sure the water was warm and not hot because it might irritate your skin. Now you rinse off all the soap. I'm leaving the water on because you don't want to turn it off the handles with your clean hands because the handles are contaminated. That was the shortcoming of the last demonstration. So I get a paper towel, I dry my hands, make sure they're thoroughly dry. Dispose of that paper towel. You get another paper towel. You turn off the handles. You dispose of that paper towel. Even when using good, proper hand washing, it's impossible to get rid of all the germs on your hands. This points out the importance of doing the best job that you can. Long fingernails harbor germs, are hard to clean, and can puncture gloves. Do not wear artificial fingernails or extenders when providing care. Keep natural nail tips less than one quarter inch long. Apply lotion at least twice a day to keep your skin moisturized. Dry, cracked, irritated skin can be an entryway for germs. Personal protective equipment, also known as PPE, is specialized clothing and equipment that protects against potentially infectious material, such as blood, respiratory secretions, and wound drainage. PPE includes gloves, gowns, masks, goggles, and face shields. Protective barriers work only if they are worn correctly and used each time they are recommended. Gloves are used during procedures that involve possible contact with body fluids. If you are taking a rectal temperature, cleaning someone after a bowel movement, changing linens, or touching equipment that may have body fluid on it, you should be wearing gloves. A good rule of thumb to remember is, if it's wet, wear gloves. Select the right size and type of glove. Latex gloves are commonly used because they are inexpensive and provide the best protection against bloodborne disease. However, about 12% of healthcare workers have latex allergies. For them, vinyl, nitrile, or other synthetic gloves are a better choice. 
gloves should fit snugly around the wrist. If you are wearing a gown, the cuff of the glove should fit over the gown sleeve. Change gloves after having contact with fecal material, wound drainage, or anything that is known to contain germs. Use a new pair of gloves for each procedure. Use gloves only once. Gloves are an important part of infection control, but they do not provide complete protection. It's possible for fluids to leak in. Gloves can become punctured. After removing gloves, it's important to clean your hands with an alcohol-based rub or wash with soap and water. You want to keep dirty to dirty and clean to clean. So you take one glove, pinch it up in the middle, pull it off, then you take your finger, which is clean, underneath the cuff, which is clean, and pull it up over the other glove until you have it into a ball, and then you properly dispose of it. Wearing a mask protects against breathing in airborne germs. Wear a mask around those who are coughing excessively, or if you could be splashed with body fluids. Masks should fully cover the nose and mouth area. If the mask has an elastic headband, hold the mask in place over the face. Stretch the band over the head and secure comfortably. Other masks are secured by an elastic band behind each ear. Masks are ineffective when they become moist, so change to a new mask if this occurs. When removing the mask, avoid touching anything but the elastic ties. The front of the mask is considered the dirtiest. Goggles should fit snugly but not tightly around the face. Flexible goggles that fit over prescription glasses are also available. Personal eyeglasses are not considered adequate eye protection. Face shields are used to protect the eyes, nose, and mouth. Disposable gowns protect against germs and small amounts of body fluid. Waterproof gowns are also available. When you put the gown on, the opening should be in back. Secure the gown at the neck and waist. If areas of your gown become saturated, change into a new gown for protection. Before you remove your gown, you first remove your gloves. So now your hands are considered clean. The front of the gown and the sleeves are considered dirty. So to remove the gown, you begin at the neck to untie the tie at the neck, and then you untie at the waist. To remove the gown off the shoulders, take your clean hand inside the clean part of the gown and remove it off your shoulders. Then you take your clean hand, go under the cuff of the sleeve, being careful not to touch the outside of the sleeve, you pull your hand in and cover it with that sleeve. And then you use this covered sleeve hand to touch the outside of the gown to pull it off the other arm. So now you have the gown in this position. And with knowing that the sleeves and the front of the gown are dirty, you fold the dirty side together away from you. Then you roll the gown and then dispose of it in a proper receptacle. Personal protective equipment is put on in this order. Begin with the gown, then the mask, put the goggles on next, and finally the gloves. Personal protective equipment is taken off in this order, beginning with the dirtiest item. Remove the gloves first, then the goggles, next remove the gown, and finally the mask. Always wash your hands after taking off and disposing of personal protective equipment. Bloodborne pathogens are microorganisms that are present in blood and blood products. They can cause disease in humans and pose serious risks for care providers. These pathogens include, but are not limited to, hepatitis B virus and HIV. As a care provider, you could be exposed to blood or body fluids that can cause infection. You should assume that blood and body fluids are potentially infectious and follow infection control precautions. Precautions include 
use of personal protective equipment when anticipating contact with blood or body fluids, washing hands and other skin surfaces with antimicrobial soap immediately after contact with blood and body fluids, careful handling and disposal of sharp instruments during and after use. If you do accidentally come in contact with blood or other infectious material, immediately flush the area with water, then notify your nursing supervisor or doctor. Needles, razors, and other sharps should be disposed of in a puncture-proof, leak-proof, appropriately marked container. Many of the injuries that occur when using needles happen during disposal. Do not recap needles before placing into the container. They should drop into the container easily. Never fill the sharps container more than three quarters full. When the container is three quarters full, close it. It is designed to lock after closing. Needles or sharps containers should not be placed in ordinary garbage. Some states impose fines for disposing of needles improperly. Follow your agency's policy and procedure for sharps container disposal or your local sanitation company for proper disposal of sharps containers. Good work practices reduce the risk of exposure to bloodborne pathogens. Linens that are contaminated with blood or body fluids should be washed immediately. Wear gloves and a gown when handling contaminated linens. Wash them separately from other family laundry in hot soapy water using one cup of bleach per load. Dry them in the dryer's hottest cycle. Wipe up blood spills immediately using disposable cleaning cloths. Small spills can be cleaned with paper towels and a bleach water solution. The standard bleach solution is one cup bleach to two and a half quarts of water. For larger spills, a blood spill kit that contains gloves, absorbent powder, disinfectant cloths, and biohazard bags can be used. Follow the directions on the kit. After the spill is absorbed, use the cards provided in the kit to gather up the material. Then use the disinfectant cloth to clean the area. Use additional wipes if needed. Then dry the area. Dispose of gloves and all cleaning materials in the biohazard bag provided and seal securely. Then wash your hands. Body fluids such as stool, urine, and blood should be flushed down the toilet. Cleaning solutions may also be disposed of in this way. When pouring fluids such as urine or cleaning solutions, avoid splashing by pouring the liquid close to the edge of the container. Other disposable items such as bed pads or dressings that contain body fluids should be wrapped in newspaper first to absorb excess moisture, then placed in a leak-proof plastic bag. Tie or twist tie the bag tightly and dispose of it in the trash. Never pick up broken glass or other sharps by hand. Instead, use a brush and dustpan or tongs and place the material in a sharps container. Store medical supplies in a clean, dry, draft-free area away from household traffic. Choose a location with adequate lighting that protects them from dirt, heat, moisture, pets, insects, and dust. Supplies should not be stored on the floor. Instead, place them in drawers, on tables, or in cabinets. Check expiration dates regularly. Throw supplies out when they have expired. As new supplies are brought into the home, bring the old supplies forward and use them first. Use the cover, a clean sheet, or plastic to cover supplies when they are not in use. Never use medical supplies that have been soiled or damaged. Opened bottles containing liquids should be stored with the cap on in a cool, dry place. Cleaning and disinfecting the living area is another important part of infection control. The person you are caring for may spend most of his or her time in one part of the house, such as the bedroom or den. This area, along with the kitchen and bathroom, should get most of your cleaning attention. 
keep the supply table and nightstand free from dust and spills. Establish a cleaning routine to save time. Start with the cleanest rooms and end with the dirtiest. Clean medical equipment in the bathroom. Then clean the bathroom last. To kill germs, use a disinfectant spray such as Lysol, Pine Sol, or the standard bleach solution. To prevent spreading germs, start at the top of the room and work toward the bottom. Clean floors, rugs, and other dirty areas last. Wash mop heads and cleaning cloths once a week to reduce germs. Dry them thoroughly before storing in the closet. Bed linens should be washed at least once a week. Fold or roll the linens when removing them to avoid shaking dust and germs into the air. Bag dirty linen in a plastic or cloth bag before carrying it through the house. Skin serves as a protective barrier against germs. Keeping the skin clean is important. It helps to stop germs on the skin from multiplying and spreading. Washing your hands after helping someone to the bathroom protects you from germs. It is also important to wash the hands of the person you are caring for to protect him or her from germs. Frequent bathing is a healthy habit for everyone. When giving someone a bed bath, wash from the cleanest area of the body to the dirtiest. Wash the face first, then the upper body and lower body. Any mild soap is safe to use. Mouth care should be done at least twice a day. The mouth contains many germs that can cause gum disease and infection. Tooth brushing is the most effective method for removing plaque and debris. It's not always possible to prevent an infection, no matter how hard you try. If you are able to recognize the first signs of an infection, you can prevent it from getting worse. Changes in the skin such as redness or rash, heat, swelling or drainage should be reported to the home care nurse or doctor. Other signs of infection are a rise in temperature greater than 100 degrees for more than 48 hours, sore throat, cough, change in color or amount of sputum, burning or painful urination, fever, chills, sweating, diarrhea, nausea or vomiting, pain or tenderness. Hand hygiene is the most effective action you can take against germs. Always wear protective barriers as recommended. Maintain good personal hygiene. The time and energy it takes to follow the guidelines presented in this program are well worth it. Good infection control is the surest way to safeguard health and well-being. Those who provide home care to several patients throughout the day should develop procedures for handling clean and dirty equipment in order to reduce the spread of germs from one patient to another. Begin by establishing a clean area in your vehicle for clean supplies such as the nursing bag. 
Choose a covered box or plastic container and store the clean supplies in this container each and every time. Choose another area and container for dirty supplies or equipment that needs to be returned and cleaned at the agency. When you go into the home, take a barrier such as newspaper with you. Place your supply bag on the barrier to protect it from dirt or pet hair. This helps to eliminate the possibility of transferring germs to the next home. Always wash your hands before going into the nursing bag. Plan ahead and remove all the supplies you will need. Place the supplies on another barrier in order to keep them clean. If you realize that you've forgotten an item after providing care, you must wash your hands again before going back into the supply bag. After you have finished using the equipment, place those items that need to be cleaned later in a plastic bag. Other equipment can be cleaned immediately with an antibacterial wipe and return to the supply bag. When you are at the car, spray the supply bag with an antibacterial spray. Store the bag in the clean container. Equipment or supplies that need to return to the agency for cleaning should remain in the dirty area. Items that need to be disposed of or cleaned should be returned to the agency.